This episode is sponsored by Simply Safe. It's easy to set up, easy to use, and protects over a million homes in the United States. Save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com/babish to learn more. All right, so 99% of the time when you hear the word pesto, you think of these five things mashed together. Raw garlic, fresh basil, pine nuts, Parmesan cheese, garlic again, come on Andy, and high quality olive oil. But while not at all traditional, pesto can be fashioned from any number of herbs, vegetables, and nuts. The word pesto itself actually referring to the act of pounding or crushing, which is why it's traditionally made with this, a mortar and pestle. You know, because this thing, the thing that you use to crush or pound things with. So let's start with the most traditional version. We're going to add one clove of garlic to our mortar, along with a teaspoon of kosher salt and 30 grams or about a quarter cup of pine nuts. Now our first step before adding anything else is pounding and mashing this into a paste. Making sure that this mixture is nice and smooth is going to help us emulsify our sauce later on. Now we can start adding the green stuff, in this case fresh basil. You want to rinse these guys, pat them dry, remove all their stems, and measure out an equal amount by weight to your pine nuts, so about 30 grams worth. It's not an exact science however, so just pile in a ton of basil, more than you think you need, and commence to pounding and mashing until you got yourself a nice chunky paste. Now it's time to add a little splash of olive oil, ultimately we're going to be adding about a third of a cup but moreover, this is our time to add the cheese, anywhere from 10 to 30 grams. I like to imagine that I'm grating the equivalent of a one inch cube into the mortar. Now we're gonna go ahead and process that together, scraping down the sides of the mortar and pestle, adding little splashes of oil as we go, ultimately resulting in a textured but smooth, almost creamy pesto. If your pesto breaks or becomes oily, you can always rescue it by blitzing it in a blender or food processor with a tablespoon of hot water. Pesto should also ideally be eaten immediately after making it, but if your intention is to store it for later, it can be accomplished. Option one is to pour a thin layer of olive oil over the top of your pesto. This effectively creates an airtight seal over the basil, which loves to discolor once it's been chopped and mashed. Another option is to blanch and shock the basil, that is, drop it into some boiling water for about five seconds, just until it starts to wilt and look like spinach, fish it out, and drop it directly into some awaiting ice water both halting the cooking and preserving the basil's color and flavor. We're then going to dry the basil on some paper towels to the very best of our ability before utilizing them in our pesto recipe as desired. In this case, we're doing the same thing, but this time in a food processor, combining our pine nuts, garlic, and salt in the bowl of the Mighty Machine, and then blitzing and pulsing together until a rough paste is formed, usually takes about 30 seconds. Once we got our paste, it's time to add the basil. In this case, I'm going to use the blanched basil, which looks like it's not going to be enough, but it is the same amount by weight. Then from this point on, it's pretty much the same procedure grating the cheese in there and slowly drizzling the oil down the feed spout while the machine is running until the paste becomes less of a paste and more of a sauce. Scrape down the sides of the bowl, make sure that everybody's good and processed, and adjust as necessary with lots and lots of olive oil. Pesto usually has a thick, almost spreadable consistency. Homemade pesto can last four to five days in the fridge, but with the basil blanching or the layer of oil can easily last one to two weeks. Although I should say again emphatically, it's best enjoyed fresh. So now let's take a peek at some variations. We're going to start with a sun-dried tomato pesto. This, instead of pine nuts, starts with 30 grams of unsalted almonds, one clove of garlic, and one teaspoon of kosher salt. Blitz together, this one not so much into a paste as a mealy kind of almond sand, to which we're going to add about one cup of rinsed and dried sun-dried tomatoes, a couple loose basil leaves, and the requisite Parmesan cheese. And because things tend to emulsify no matter what in a blender or food processor, I'm going to add all the oil all at once right up front. Mash go, process until the desired consistency is achieved, adjust with oil, salt, or additional sun-dried tomatoes if necessary, spoon it out into a container however messily, and call it a day. Now before anybody gets mad at me, these next few recipes are going to be prefaced with the emphatic warning, these are not traditional pestos. First up, a kale and walnut pesto. All the ratios in these recipes are pretty much the same, so I got 30 grams of blanched kale, 30 grams of walnuts. I'm doubling up the garlic because of how much kale loves garlic, blitzing that together in a chunky paste, adding the kale, blitzing that into a less chunky paste, adding the cheese, in this case Parmesan and Romano, and emulsifying together with anywhere from a quarter to a half a cup of olive oil. You'd also throw some other fresh herbs in there like parsley or tarragon. And there you have it, kale pesto, perfect for your new American restaurant, to be served alongside things like Marcona almonds and ramps. Next up, one of the wackier ones, carrot top pesto. And no, I'm not referring to... This is a pesto that finally answers the question, what the hell do I do with the tops of the carrots that come with the carrots? 
Well, why not make pesto out of them and with fun things like pepitas and cotija cheese? The result is a nutty, earthy, vegetal pesto, perfect for impressing and or confusing friends. Lastly, let's go really crazy with something like pistachios, garlic, blanched and shocked sugar snap peas, a little bit of fresh mint, and ricotta salata. Adjust its taste with salt, pepper, and lemon zest. Here's a pesto that could be used just as easily as a sauce as it could be for a dip. So that's how you make pesto, now how do you eat it? Well, the most common and arguably best way is with pasta. As you can see, I'm cooking mine in the basil and vegetable blanching water, only telling you that so you're not grossed out by its color, cooking the pasta to manufacture a suggested doneness, reserving at least half a cup of starchy pasta to cooking water and draining the rest, putting it right back into the hot pan. Because the only heat we want touching our pesto is the residual heat. So we're gonna add the pesto directly to the drained pasta along with about a quarter cup of that reserved pasta water, setting the rest aside in the event of an emergency. Now we want to agitate the pasta together with the pesto with great vigor, emulsifying together the pesto and the pasta cooking water into an almost creamy sauce. And now I'm gonna ask any Italians in the room to please cover your ears, because I'm going to suggest something downright sacrilegious, and that is to finish your pesto pasta with butter two tablespoons worth for a pound of pasta like this. Not only does butter obviously make everything taste better, it helps stabilize the resulting sauce. So not only does everything end up thicker and creamier, it doesn't split into an oily mess after sitting around for more than 60 seconds. And I mean, it's hard to argue with the results. Look at that, oh, 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 don't look, don't look at that. There you go, look, look at that. Rich, creamy sauce clinging to every square inch of El Dente pasta. This here is our first basil pesto, but you can use any of the delicious iterations whipped up today in the same manner. So, as usual, I encourage you to see what's nutty and herby in your life and mash it together. You never know what might come out. Probably pesto. Hopefully pesto. Thanks again to Simply Safe for sponsoring this episode. It really is that easy to set up. I got mine up and running in under an hour. I have wireless cameras, sensors on the windows and doors, plus a carbon monoxide detector. There's never a long-term contract, and the monitoring costs less than $1 per day. A Simply Safe system would also make a great Father's Day gift. You can save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com/babish to learn more.